Representation matters. We saw how much it matters several weeks ago when many Americans breathe a sigh of relief after four years of what has been imagined as an aberration of American government. A Harris-Biden government is now on the horizon. Kamala Harris has become the first female, first black and first Asian American vice president elect in history. The sense of hope many felt partly reflects the dominant presumption that the arrival of racialized politicians guarantees a move to racial progress and social justice. We expect things should be different now. Indeed, the political inclusion of previously excluded racialized populations matters. This presentation is concerned with how it matters. Incorporation has also helped to sustain a political order that has been racially violent. The arrival of other firsts, including but not limited to Nikki Haley, Condoleezza Rice, and Jennifer Carnahan pictured here, have demonstrated this. For those of us that have kept our eye on racial violence in the long arc of American democracy, the sigh of relief does not come as easily. By briefly reviewing one case study of the first Korean senator in Canada, I highlight the criticality of attention to structural power the seat, the table, and the terms of incorporation. This allows us to trace the preservation of dominant racial discourses, policies, and systems, which not only foreclose possibilities for substantive diversity, but also actively operate to neutralize critiques of state, military, and police violence. It is in such a context that post-racial discourses not only persist alongside explicit racial violence, but make its very conditions possible. A case study, a beacon of hope for Afghanistan, question mark. July 27, 2013 marked the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Korean War Armistice. Written by Canada's first Senator of Korean descent, Bill S-213, an act respecting a National Day of Remembrance to honor Canadian veterans of the Korean War, had recently received royal assent. According to Stephen Harper, 2013, the year of the Korean veteran, Korean War veteran, quote, honors their brave fight to defend the Republic of Korea and uphold freedom, democracy, and the rule of law during one of the most significant armed conflicts of the 20th century, unquote. Described as one of the most challenging chapters in our nation's proud military history, Harper, like Senator Yona Kim Martin, on numerous other occasions, make clear exactly who and what Canadians remember. Who we remember are the 26,000 Canadians who fought in Korea between 1950 to 1953, and the 516 Canadians who made the ultimate sacrifice. What we remember is the global importance of Canada's military. Our contribution of troops was one of the largest. Emphasizing the continued importance of the Canadian military, the PM closed his statement by linking our remembrance of Korean War veterans to our support for, quote, the men and women who continue to serve our country today, unquote. Indeed, Canada's military in 2013 was in the final years of what became a 12 year long engagement in the Afghanistan war, oft rehearsed as the largest Canadian mission abroad since the Korean War. Afghanistan was routinely conjured on occasions remembering the Korean War. For instance, Senator Martin frequently drew from her parents' stories of rescue from North Korean communist terror and finding freedom and democracy in Canada. She suggests that, quote, perhaps the Republic of Korea stands as a beacon of hope for the people of Afghanistan, unquote. I explore the ways in which the connections made between Korea and Afghanistan have been both generative and destructive. By examining parliamentary speeches and documents, I do two things. I investigate how the Korean Peninsula and Afghanistan are officially explained as places gripped by communist terrorist regimes, imperiling not only the lives of civilians, but also threatening global peace and security. I examine the Korean War as central to not only the expansion of the Canadian military, but also as it defined Canada's support for American imperial wars that would follow. I expose how the government of Canada relied on settler colonial militarism as a blueprint for its imperial militarism in Korea and reached for this blueprint again in Afghanistan. Secondly, I examine the role of nations and subjects liberated or rescued by a UN backed US empire led war machine demonstrating in their scripts and activities the reach of that powerful axiom engraved on the American Korean War Veterans Memorial that freedom is not free.
in his 1950 address to the graduating class at the University of Toronto, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent delivered a speech entitled The Preservation of Civilization. Identifying the global menace facing the Western world as communism, Saint Laurent explains this threat as political, military, and above all, civilizational. Describing communist governments as repugnant and barbaric, Saint Laurent assures young Canadians that, quote, the building up of that deterrent strength through the North Atlantic Alliance, and more recently through the UN action in Korea, has been the first preoccupation, preoccupation of the government of Canada, unquote. Deborah Cohen has noted that in this period, while Can Canadian national culture was militarized in order to protect the nation from potential American invasion, the Canadian military was in fact rebuilt after post-World War II demobilization to support American imperial wars. It was indeed as a result of a direct request from Truman in 1951 for help in Korea that Canada rearmed at a shocking speed and scale. The total cost of this rearmament over three years exceeded $5 billion. The defense budget multiplied by five times between 1950 and 1953. Necessarily elided in St. Laurent's framing of the Korean War as a civilizational war between the US and the Soviet Union and their respective allies is any historical context and geopolitical specificity that would in fact challenge the war's supposed beginning and end. Scholars of US military empire in Asia and the Pacific have provided the context, which for sake of time, I can only briefly review. In 1945, three days after bombing the civilian city of Nagasaki, President Truman deputized two junior army officers, Bond Steele and Rusk, to adjourn to a room. With a National Geographic map in hand and without consulting any Koreans, they drew a line through the Korean Peninsula at the 38th parallel and divided the country into occupation zones. Hong reminds us that the drawing of that line was realized on the ground through profound bloodshed and precipitated a war of national reunification that began years before the US designation of the official start of the war, when as it was popularly accounted, the North attacked the South. Challenging this official account, Kimmon demonstrates how what began essentially as a local civil conflict and decolonization project in a small nation became ensnared within the global Cold War superpower rivalry. Political tensions in Korea, a legacy of Japanese colonial occupation, were exacerbated when the US occupation forces in the South formed a governing commission of several hundred conservatives who had collaborated with the Japanese colonial administration. Left critique in Korea, both communist and non-communist, including anti-colonial resistors, populists, and advocates of land reform were all collapsed under the enemy category of communist and targeted and repressed by this formation of a pro-American elite in the South. If the pattern of US foreign intervention has been to overthrow leftist leadership and impose right-wing regimes, which in turn support US interests as scholars have documented, it was certainly the case in South Korea when the US propped up right-wing pro-capitalist dictator Lee Sung-man in 1947 someone who had no popular support and who had been living in exile in the United States. So before the start of the war, while the North led by Kim Il-sung and the South led by Lee Sung-man might have appealed to their respective occupying superpowers for military aid, each group sought to reunify their country on their terms with the ultimate goal of independence. But within the context of Cold War geopolitics, Washington policymakers could not and did not interpret the North's attack on the South as part of a continuum in Korea's lo own local efforts at reunification. Although by 1949, both Soviet and American occupation forces had pulled out, the Cold War scene of persuasion, as Jody Kim calls it, convinced the US that it was Soviet sponsored. Thus, Truman saw it as a direct Soviet challenge to and test of American power, not only in Asia, but the rest of the world. As such, Truman quickly decided to intervene by circumventing a formal declaration of war, which would have required the approval of Congress via a UN resolution for a police action that turned into a de facto US operation in Korea. Indeed, remembrance of the Korean War has not only centered on Canadian veterans, on detailing victory, national remembrance has also marginalized those directly impacted by the war. <clears throat> 
reducing them to collateral damage in worthy battles. Prompted by Thobani to recognize the sheer corporal reality of the terrain upon which mass terror is waged, I briefly detail the carnage that was wrecked in the name of peace and liberty. Every major town and city was destroyed during the Korean War. At least 10% of the population was dead, and the vast majority of those surviving were homeless. Three million Korean civilian casualties, in addition, two million missing or wounded, almost 10 million Koreans separated from friends and relatives and fewer than 10,000 of them reunited since. As part of the coalition governments engaged in a carefully orchestrated propaganda campaign, John Price has reminded us that the Canadian government misled parliament, encouraged censorship of the press, and intimidated the peace movement. Speaking in the House of Commons in May 1952, Lester Pearson unequivocally denied the charge that UN forces in Korea had engaged in germ warfare. However, we know now that in Korea, Washington introduced that what it calls weapons of mass destruction, weapons so heinous that the US would decades later target other governments who harbored them as terrorist enemies. Relentless aerial bombing and the dropping of a new weapon called napalm almost completely leveled Northern and Central Korea. As documented by historians, Canadian soldiers were also court-martialed for war crimes, cases which were predominantly reported in Canada as isolated incidents perpetrated by soldiers who are bad apples. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands of such violent crimes committed by UN forces. Of the 60 or so Canadian cases that actually came to trial, most of those con convicted were released upon their return to Canada. Stories about military racial violence are transformed into stories about, to borrow from Razak, dark threats and white knights. In 2002, Canadian white knights were recruited for another American imperial war. In his forward to the final report to Parliament on Canada's engagement in Afghanistan, Harper explains why Canada became an early coalition partner. Echoing Cold War scripts delivered by his predecessors, Harper identified the 2001 terrorist attacks on the United States as quote, an armed attack against all members of NATO and those who perpetrated this act of violence did so with impunity from within Afghanistan. Or in Yona Martin's words, we fight a new enemy with an all too familiar and ancient cause, unquote. Again, evacuated from this official account is any historical context or geopolitical specificity that would better explain the US invasion of Afghanistan. Indeed, scholars have exposed how it was the American administration's economic and political interests which led to its initial support of the Taliban in the mid-1990s. Lavani has called attention to how Afghan women's groups actively resisted the Taliban and the Northern Alliance at that time, which the U.S. government then backed in 2002. These groups made it abundantly clear that U.S. military intervention was not going to lead to the emancipation of women in Afghanistan disavowing women's organized resistance again, war and terror discourses instead depicted them as victims of Islamic culture to be pitied and saved by the West. PM Harper reported that our engagement in Afghanistan, the longest armed conflict in our history has been like no other. More than military, he clarifies that Canada embraced a whole of government approach a war involving mass civilian death is instead reported as one that involves setting benchmarks, baselines, and progress indicators, which allowed the government to report successful quarterly targets achieved. This whole of government approach involved a provincial reconstruction team utilizing personnel from the military, foreign affairs, the Canadian International Development Agency, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which would provide a dual role of security as well as reconstruction of the country. If its task was to bring Western liberal democracy, specifically rule of law to a country routinely described as a failed state, Canada's progress priorities were measured by the building of Afghanistan's military and national police forces, a corrections infrastructure, intelligence, education, economic initiatives, especially microfinancing and the encouragement of women borrowers, democratic development, and the support for human rights. The plow and the rifle. Canadian historians have documented how war and military commemoration were central to Harper's politics of history. Commemoration of the Canada's role in the Korean War has been one part of a larger endeavor to re-narrate Canadian history.
remembering the nation's foundations as rooted in military triumphs are instructive. They become national ritual for proud Canadians and it gives coherence to our military interventions in the present and future. Omitted from this remembering is the sustained role that the Canadian military, the RCMP, and other police forces have played in the original and ongoing national development strategies aimed to assimilate Indigenous people. In Canada, like the US, World War II renewed the role of war power in dispossessing Indigenous people. For example, the Department of National Defense, the DND, decided during World War II that it should establish an army training facility on the Stony Point Reserve near Lambton, Ontario. Despite protests by Indigenous people of Kettle and Stony Point bands, 2,240 acres of their property was appropriated on April 14, 1942, under the War Measures Act. Residents were evicted from their land and houses were bulldozed. Over the next five decades, Canada's promise to return this land after World War II was betrayed when the DND insisted that it continued to need the camp for military training. Former residents of the Stony Point Reserve protested the military ranges of Camp Iberwash, which resulted in the 1995 police shooting death of Dudley George. During the Korean War, soldiers of the 2nd Canadian Rifle Battalion and the 3rd Battalion were trained at Canadian Forces bases, including Camp Iberwash. The transformation of Indigenous land into terra nullius in the name of national security compels us to examine war power as an ongoing motor of both military, imperial, and settler colonial formations. In his 1951 speech titled Canadian Foreign Policy in a Two-Power World, Lester Pearson, then Minister of External Affairs, explained the burden that free nations faced with the rising threat of global communism and anti-colonial movements and affirmed Canada's obligation in America's war in Canada, in Korea. In his speech, he explicitly evoked the centrality of militarism to settler colonialism. I quote, we are faced now with a similar situation in some respects to that which confronted our forefathers in early colonial days. If they stuck to the plow and left the rifle at home, they would have been easy victims for any savages lurking in the woods. The same combination is required today. We must keep on plowing harder than ever while we arm. We should accept without reservation the view that the Canadian who fires his rifle in Korea is defending his home as surely as if he were firing it on his own soil." Unquote. I argue that the blueprint for imperial militarism in 1950 relied on the settler colonial militarism that founded the nation. These racial logics give coherence to the eight tribal ships A class of destroyers built for the Cana Royal Canadian Navy, named after Indigenous people that Canada sought to eliminate, which sailed to the Korean Peninsula to fight battles in another war. The Canadian government reached for this blueprint once again in 2002. What the Afghans need, said one conservative columnist, is colonialism. While centralizing remembrance of military history, Harper simultaneously declared that Canada has no history of colonialism. One can glean how for Harper, like his predecessors, a history of colonialism is instead a history of civilizational military triumph, a settler colonialism achieved with a rifle as much as it was by the plow, the brutal dispossession of indigenous people led by a national military and police forces, which has never stopped targeting land defenders is erased in this national memory. The many murdered were collateral damage in this worthy civilizational war on the home front and to this day remain not high on our radar. Through its whole of government approach, the Canadian government revealed the continued significance of the rifle and the plow in its participation in imperial war today. I argue that these omissions, the omission of these links has been necessary and deliberate. Martin's expressions of um, uh, appointed Senator by Harper in 2009, Yona Martin Kim uh, serves as a quote, community activist and a voice of authority for Canadians of Korean descent, unquote. Her maiden speech, like many of her speeches that follow it, emphasized the conservative government's exceptional commitment to freedom, justice, rule of law, the industrious work ethic of Korean Canadians, the problem of North Korea and the sparkling democracy that is South Korea, which is routinely and directly attributed to Canadian veterans who saved it from communist terror. 
As Canadians, we are directed to mourn the lives of our soldiers. As Korean Canadians, we are instructed that we owe them our lives. Their heroism was a gift for our rescue. We owe them a debt. I quote, honorable senators, there are no words to express the indebtedness and respect that an entire nation feels toward the veterans of the Korean War. The Korean community across Canada in solidarity with Koreans around the world will never forget how Canadian soldiers answered a call to serve for a strange people in a foreign land across an ocean. I owe my very existence to them, unquote. Martin's expressions of gratitude might be understood through what Mimi Nguyen calls the gift of freedom, which constitutes a debt that the refugee must repay, even lending themselves as liberalism's allies for new racial, new violations against racial others. Martin's contributions might be located in a structural legacy of the Cold War. In his explanation of South Korea's troop commitment to the US More Flags Coalition in Vietnam in 1965, then South Korean President Park Joon-hee opined that it was a way of repaying those 16 free nations which came to our military aid during the World Korean War. According to the 1975 US Army study, Allied Participation in Vietnam, South Korea was vital to the More Flags Initiative's success, wherein every Korean soldier sent to South Vietnam saved the US from sending an American into battle, plus commanded far lower pay. Rather than celebrated, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, and Thailand were named as accomplices to US aggression by the 1967 International War Crimes Tribunal on Vietnam, revealing Nixon's doctrine of using Asian boys to fight Asian boys. Hong emphasizes how at one tribunal hearing, a former army special forces soldier testified that US recourse to Asian mercenaries was aimed at deflecting culpability. Quote, we were continuously told you don't have to kill them yourself. Let your indigenous counterpart do that, unquote. Indeed, in a violent piece, Hong finds that the lesson for those in the ambit of US military empire was plain. Access to post-war modernity could be had at a price, complicity in the US war machine. Where the imperative of US military expansion was to restructure the region as a free market zone, the economic development of South Korea under the military dictatorship of Park Jong-hee meant displacing the pursuit of decolonizing justice while circumventing local processes of democratic self-determination. That is, regional democratization has been realized through the active suppression of democracy. In the region where the US waged catastrophic anti-communist wars of intervention, militarism would be promoted as a stabilizer of democracy and the basis of capitalist futurity rather than a crisis generating architecture responsible for instability. The legacy of this militarized democratization is revealed in the 2014 signing of the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, which was jointly announced by Harper and now ousted President Park Geun-hye, Park Jong-hee's daughter. This first trade agreement for Canada in the Asia Pacific region wouldn't have been possible, declared Senator Martin, without the sacrifices of our veterans who fought valiantly against communist aggression now the FTA is a dream come true. Martin declared that South Korea has risen from the ashes of war to transform itself from being the second poorest nation in the world to becoming one of the leaders of the industrialized world. If militarized democratization has grown South Korea into a sparkling democracy, North Korea has remained a problem. Soon after her Senate appointment, Martin commended Canada for co-sponsoring a UN resolution which urges North Korea to ensure full, rapid, and uninterrupted access of humanitarian assistance and to engage fully with the international community. As was the case in 1951, Canada will stand against North Korean tyranny." Unquote. Noting the disturbing continuities in the discursive and geopolitical matrices of the Cold War and the more recent War on Terror, Kim and Hong and others have each examined how this fixation on North Korea as a problem as it returns as part of the axis of evil, obscures America's role in literally giving birth to that problem in the first place with the drawing of that line. We must remember that while the signing of the armistice in 1953 recommended that all three signatories arrange the withdrawal of foreign forces from Korea within 90 days, war instead became an extended present. Hong reminds us that while China withdrew its forces from North Korea within five years, the US to this day still stations 28,500 troops 
and operates roughly 100 military installations south of the ironically named demilitarized zone. Integral to the legitimation of the US's ongoing strategic presence of military bases in Asia has been sustained demonology of North Korea, a country that has never not been under the threat of US war. Hong reminds us that in the middle part of the 20th century, the United States dropped 420,000 bombs on Pyongyang, a city which at the time had an estimated 400,000 residents. That is literally more than one bomb per person. And that has had serious structural consequences that are elided in simplified ahistorical representations that deem it a failed state and thus a permissible military target. Indeed, peaceful reunification efforts demonstrated by both Koreas have been routinely stalled by a military industrial complex that remains deeply invested in their separation. To quote Hong, as anti-base and people's democracy activists have for decades sought to bring into view, democracy, far from gifted by the US, has in fact risen from below in Asian and Pacific Islander nations. Theirs has been a ceaseless battle within the formidable grid of US military imperialism. While in Canada, multiculturalism policy has been popularly traced back to 1971, an examination of the Korean War's impact forces us to look further back still. In 2017, Martin attributed her own place in Senate to the efforts of Canadian born and aliens of Chinese, Japanese, South Asian, and African descent who joined the Canadian military effort in World War II after fighting for their country, she says, not against it. They returned to Canada and fought for their citizenship and ours. She says, freedom is not free. For populations in Canada whose annihilation, subjugation and exclusion were legally secured, political franchise was an important goal in asserting their humanity. While opinions were varied, for many BIPOC, enlisting in the Canadian military was imagined as crucial to their struggles for political franchise. Asians who were already presumed duplicitous knew that Canada's entry into the Pacific theater would intensify their place as enemies within the nation. It was reason that going, joining the Canadian military would allow them to prove their national loyalty. Fujitani, Yoniyama and others have examined post-war inclusion as military strategy the West could no longer afford to ignore even their most objected populations. What Esperitu calls military multiculturalism and Malamed calls Cold War multiculturalism sheds light on the total war origins of the racially incorporative logic of post-war US militarism, which I argue can be traced in Canada as well. For instance, in March, 2012, Senator Martin drew our attention to quote, the 60th anniversary of the death of Private Kenneth Bryant Jones, a proud black soldier from Windsor, Ontario, one of our wonderful Canadians of color who fell in the Korean War. It is an accolade to our Canadian heritage that in our Canadian forces, all who served were treated equally with no distinction made based on one's religion, racial or cultural uniqueness." Unquote. Such narratives completely omit deep historical and ongoing racism in the Canadian forces. Until 1942, the National Selective Service enforced racial restrictions. Non-white men who wanted to enlist because there were so few employment opportunities were initially rejected as it was imagined as a white man's war. Such narratives also obscure how black and indigenous veterans that returned to Canada from the wars, world wars and Korea have faced systemic barriers to citizenship rights, veterans benefits and employment opportunities. Indeed, we must interrogate the dominant script that the war ushered in a racial break wherein military desegregation has become celebrated as a civil rights landmark in both the US and Canada, and that the war opened up new possibilities and opportunities for racialized people. For instance, in our examination of black women's war work in the 1940s, Dion Brand found that despite nationwide NSS recruitment campaigns that stressed patriotic duty, the principal motivation for black women in entering the wartime job market was indeed not the need to do patriotic service, but economic necessity. Marjorie Lucy is quoted by Brand. We weren't allowed to go into the factory until Hitler started the war. We weren't, but we weren't allowed in before. We were left more or less to clean their dirty houses. Then we had a chance to go and work in the ammunition dump. They called it GICO. That's where Centennial College is now. Used to be the war plant, 
I lasted about a week there. I couldn't stay because I started to hemorrhage. The work was filling magazines, little pellets with gunpowder for the soldiers or working with hand grenades. Indeed, black women in Canada and the US were not only segregated, but were exposed to the most dangerous and grueling jobs that a factory had to offer. During the war, certain men's jobs were converted to women's work and in the process downgraded to lower pay and status, but others were converted to black women's work of, greater, of ever greater inferiority. In airplane assembly plants, black women stood in stifling dope rooms filled with the nauseating fumes of glue, while white women sat on stools in the well-ventilated serving room. Elsewhere, black women worked in poisonous plastics and acetone, scaling mud and hazardous equipment. Furthermore, they were routinely assigned disengaging night shifts, received little pay, and experienced and resisted against the laissez-faire racism on the job in the war plants and in other industries. After the war, observes Brand, unemployment rates among non-whites increased more than twice as much as among whites. By 1948, most of the gains that Black people had derived from the wartime boom had been wiped out. Eliding all this, the scripts that Yona Martin and others have offered also continue to shape how the nation views itself as raceless, as exceptionally progressive. My investigation of the unending Korean War, in Hong's words, is thus in part tracing the institutionalization of post-racialism, wherein, to borrow from Hong again, military peace introduced a necropolitical order in which unfreedom is presented as freedom, democratization as democracy, and militarism as the basis for life itself. Strategies of flexible racial governance made possible by the Cold War structural legacies cannot be underestimated. As a crisis in global capitalism, the Cold War made possible US global hegemony, of which Canada was and remains a coalition partner. Canada has actively participated in military interventions that claim to set the civilizational standard as it overtly institutionalizes racial profiling across the nation and around the world. In figures such as Senator Martin, we see how racialized political elites have been brought into line to support racist imperialist ideals or practices. If in Canada, we are provided with freedom of speech, freedom of independent thought, freedom of religion, as Senator Martin proclaimed in 2012, this was hardly the case after September 11, when those who deigned to challenge simplified representations of Muslim terror were swiftly censured. The violent reaction to Sabani's speech after 9-11 and the notoriety gained by Senator Martin has been instructive. As we claim the right to speak, are appointed and elected as political representatives, the disciplinary mechanisms of liberalism with its roots in racializing Cold War politics become all too clear and challenge this potent democratic aura. Where official narratives that present war as peace have powerfully obscured critique as traitorous behavior, incorporation into institutions that generate racial unfreedom can be linked to a long legacy of counter-revolutionary violence. When assimilation is considered the marker of racial progress, enduring structural inequities are minimized. My concern is about how power structures endure both despite and through incorporative politics. It is a concern not about left or right politics, but rather projects reliant on uh, a progressive teleology of Western liberal democracy and its capitalist colonial imperial arteries. This impacts the struggle to decide what ethical racial justice looks like, what happens when we desire the bodies, but not the politics. I close, and I want to close by gesturing to a different beacon of hope. It is well known that black radical anti-fascist activists publicly denounced the US invasion of Korea. Their critique stemmed from the recognition that police and military repression of anti-racist struggles stateside were intimately tied to military intervention against anti-colonial struggles abroad. I quote from Eldridge Cleaver of the Black Panther Party. The great example of the Korean people's struggle against the United States is a beacon light of hope to all the peoples of the world who are struggling for liberation, unquote. This gesture might signal the urgency of remembering the Korean War differently by considering what is left out of detailed diplomatic histories dominant Cold War knowledge projects and national memory, attentive to the seductive structures of racial violence, engineered to disrupt radicalism. This gesture might recuperate that expansive critique of empire for today for a renewed radical global politics rooted in non-aligned knowledge. <laughs>
Thank you.